Uh, welcome everyone to the 3 p.m. session uh, titled Energy Communities and Cities Working Hand in Hand for the Energy Transition. My name is Ashul Hanaset. I work for DG Ener Unit B1. We are responsible for consumer issues, but also local initiatives um, like the Covenant of Mayors. And me particularly, I'm uh, specialized in energy communities. So very much looking forward to uh, today's session and, and learn a bit more how um, they can collaborate with local authorities. Um, I will be moderating the session and we are joined today by a group of distinguished speakers, including uh, Alex Boller from Energy Cities, Anna Yael Baptiste from Energit If, John Van Dalen from Energent, and Anna Marie Hoffman from Kroeninger Power. Um, today's session will start with a very brief overview by myself of the EU framework, just to refresh your minds, and I will put an emphasis on local authorities and their role. Uh, next, we will um, have the speakers give the speakers the floor. First, we'll have a very general presentation on the role of authorities and how they can help energy communities. And then we'll dive in deep and, and look at some uh, particular empirical case examples uh, to make it all a bit more, uh, more uh, materialized. Uh, at the end, we will have a Q&A session um, throughout the session, just feel free to drop your questions in the chat box, indicate which speaker you are addressing the question to, and then at the very end, um, I will make sure that some of these questions will be selected and accordingly answered by the correct person. So um, let's start. Um, I will, so you can go to the next uh, slide. I will first talk about uh, the EU framework very, very briefly. Um, next slide, please. So the EU framework has two, um, uh, con well, two concepts. Um, next slide. We have the citizen energy community and we have the renewable energy community, and they share uh, a common core. Uh, they, they need to be organized through a legal entity. They need to be uh, uh, ensuring um, democratic participation through open and voluntary participation, uh, more precisely. And their primary purpose is to deliver um, environmental, economic, and social benefits. And so they put value over profit. Next slide, please. There are also some key differences, um, mainly the actors that are allowed to participate in the energy communities. As we see for uh, Czech citizen energy communities, any entity may participate. For REC, this is limited to natural persons, uh, SMEs, and local authorities. Um, when it comes to effective control, and that is uh, um, translated in effective control over decision making uh, in, the, in the energy community, then um, citizen energy communities are more uh, narrowed down to uh, natural persons, local authorities, and small enterprises. And for REC, um, it's the same actors that are allowed to participate, but there is a geographical component. They need to be located in uh, proximity of the installations. Um, last but not least, for REC, there's also this requirement of autonomy, uh, which uh, ensures that they are protected from external interests. Next slide, please. Gilles? Uh, maybe it's my screen, but I'm, I'm not seeing um, the slides uh, move. Okay, next slide. Uh, we'll go into the enabling framework. So we gave REC and GEC at the uh, European level uh, some rights, some responsibilities, and some privileges um, to enter on the, on the market on a level playing field with more established and traditional actors. Um, for GEC, this is a facilitating framework uh, to, to have a market integration. Um, and that means that non-discriminatory proportionate procedures and charges are, are at the core, really, of this framework. Uh, the same also applies for REC, but for REC we went a step further and, and we also included some privileges. And, and one of them uh, that is most interesting, I think, for this today's session is um, the regulatory and capacity building support to public authorities that member states uh, should ensure. Uh, next slide. And uh, that was it uh, from my side. So I suggest that um, I would like to give the floor to uh, Alex Bolle, who uh, coordinates the EU climate and energy advocacy strategy at Energy Cities Brussels office. And Alex, the floor is yours to tell us more about how local authorities can help energy communities. Thank you very much, Achille. Um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm going to 
share my presentation um, do you see it in full screen now or almost all right that should be it now Very good. yes uh, great. So indeed, um, hello everyone, uh, and thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm very glad to to be among this this distinguished panel, as you said. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have the very difficult task of giving a short overview of a topic. There is so much to say about, uh, which is uh, yeah, indeed the the numbers of ways uh, through which uh, cities can indeed uh, scale up the community energy movement, and because I think they really have they can really have a leverage effect that is huge and a transformative power um, that is uh, very big. So in these, uh, indeed, cities are betting very high on energy democracy, on uh, supporting energy communities uh, at all steps of the way. Uh, but I think it's important to say um, that they are actually uh, doing this um, not only to fast track renewable energy projects uh, acceptance, um, they're doing this uh, because they see energy community and um, community energies uh, as generating much more uh, than renewable energy. So uh, I think this is very important to mention that this is not uh, about public acceptance, this is about public empowerment. So this is really what links also cities to community energy. And I just wanted it to link it with a news event that the most of you has, have probably heard yesterday that the Swiss uh, people actually uh, voted down uh, the climate law of the government uh, altogether in a referendum. Uh, and according to some analysts, uh, this is uh, because of the perceived, uh, you know, uh, unfairness this would put on some categories um, of the population in terms of uh, not promoting a fair uh, economic transition. And this is also what we had uh, observed uh, with the Yellow Vest movement in France. So I think it's ever more important. So this is actually a case in point. It's not just about words to say that uh, it's also, this is also about creating new local economic models, uh, new economic paradigms. This is also why cities emb embark on this journey, uh, creating more democratic practices in the way they provide uh, energy services. Uh, and uh, what they have in common with the energy uh, cooperatives, with energy communities, is that they really want to tackle the issue of uh, fuel poverty. Uh, and they want to link also, they want to reinvest uh, the revenues of uh, renewable energy projects, for example, in energy efficiency ones, really creating a virtuous circular uh, economic processes. And I think this is very important. Uh, very quickly, again, I wanted to illustrate also this point um, to show how important this is on the city's agenda, giving the example of the Barcelona uh, municipal authorities. Uh, they have created a 100% public utility. It's called Barcelona Energia. Um, uh, with the wish, notably, um, to um, tackle fuel poverty, but also to break away uh, from uh, the oligopolistic model that dominates the Spanish energy market. So this is the, these are the, work, the words of the energy agency. So it, it doesn't come from uh, activists or NGOs. So it, it's really showing uh, the wish also of the cities to really shake the system and, and be radical in this transformation. Uh, and they also have a very governance process, uh, democratic governance process associated to it. Uh, even though it could not be qualified as an energy community in the strict sense uh, of the definition. They have a council of users made up of consumers of the uh, electricity, uh, supplier of the, of, the, of the electricity, of the utility, uh, made up of uh, neighborhood associations. So really, again, this democratic wish, I think, is very important uh, to mention. Now, moving to the different roles that the cities can play indeed. So uh, from the very uh, upstream uh, role of... Uh, providing a fertile ground, the, or the right ecosystem for the project to develop through uh, the policy, through the regulation, down to uh, really supporting the project uh, as a facilitator, as a catalyst, as a client uh, of the energy community or as a member of the energy community, indeed, uh, as uh, is now um, foreseen uh, also through the definition. So uh, acting as a policy enabler, uh, I can give the example of uh, local and regional authorities that are putting forward uh, qualitative or even quantitative figure-based targets on, on uh, improving the or increasing the number of 
um, the share of uh, renewable uh, capacity that is locally owned or that is citizen owned by citizens. Uh, in the south of France, for example, the Occitanie region wants to have 500 citizen energy projects by 2030 and 100,000 uh, shareholders of these projects. Uh, it's about uh, encouraging developers uh, through municipal council decisions, for example, to open the capital of projects to citizen participation. It's about imposing special requirements on future municipal development and altogether, as I mentioned, uh, adopting an inclusive approach uh, through the climate and towards the climate and energy transition through climate arenas, through citizen conventions, local COP21s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so acting as a project facilitator, this is perhaps the most uh, straightforward way that cities can help uh, developing dedicated uh, funding instruments. So not only to pay for the actual installations, but also for all the technical assistance. And this is huge. Yeah, that um, is, um, I, I have a quick issue because there's a PDF for, for, for one of the speakers. Uh, uh, okay. cool. I think uh, I think someone needs to mute their microphone. <laughs> um, I think uh, yeah, you're, you're not muted. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so dedicating uh, funding instruments. Sorry about that for feasibility studies, uh, for in, uh, developing the investment concept, um, providing the legal and human resource supports, uh, providing a bank guarantee can often be very useful also because uh, the bank can be quite skeptical skeptical perhaps towards a newly formed energy community so if the city is there to provide a guarantee it can help also uh, the project get off the ground providing access to municipal property is also uh, one of the most obvious example i was uh, in discussion a few days ago with the metropolitan area of Strasbourg, where they are just about to issue a call for expression of interest uh, for a PV installation in the roof of a school. And I think it's uh, very um, interesting to mention that they plan to write in this call uh, that eligible applicants will only be in citizen energy communities as per the EU definition. So this is a very concrete illustration of how cities are helping putting that uh, this legislation into practice, uh, developing guidance and tools such as one-stop shops or heat maps, uh, solar cadasters. I mean, uh, there are so many uh, to, to mention. Acting uh, as a um, yeah, providing uh, communication and support and acting as the middleman is also crucial, for example, towards distribution system operator. Uh, in the climate plant of Ghent, I thought it was interesting to mention that they see themselves as an energy broker also to make the links towards all the local economic operators. So this is really crucial. And as you mentioned, Achille, uh, the directive now uh, also, um, and I hope it won't change, um, uh, also is uh, asking upper member states to uh, provide this capacity building support and to help cities really be this play this role of project facilitator. Uh, they can also become, um, they can be customers, they, they are big energy consumers, the cities, the, the local and regional authorities, so they can actually buy the services of the energy communities, but not only the, the the electricity supply, because we know that the electricity directive allows for energy communities to be present on so many different energy services. I wanted to give the original example of the city of Halle in Belgium, where they have uh, this, um, they have set up, they have a contract with a local cooperative, uh, Pajo Power, uh, whereby uh, citizens have been invest, uh, invited to co-invest in the in the new LED street lighting of the city via the cooperative to adopt their street lamp. So it can really it can really take all kinds of shapes, uh, and it's also about adopting public procurement criteria that are not just green not, not just green components but components that really. Uh, direct also the, the public procurement more towards uh, typically um, energy cooperatives or energy communities. And we know that cities are doing this not only for electricity provision, but also on district heating systems, for example. And then lastly, uh, but not least, obviously now uh, cities can become an actual shareholder. Uh, it, it's foreseen in the EU legislation. In France, it's been uh, possible since 2015. And since then, uh, a lot of cities has, uh, have really started doing that. Uh, to give a couple more examples, uh, in the UK, the um, Plymouth Energy Community, which is a very original one that was initially created with the intention to uh, tackle fuel poverty, but had just helping consumers switch um, electricity providers and make more sense of their bills, but has now moved to include other services and generate electricity, etc. Uh, it was uh, initially founded by the council and the council uh, has a convention agreement with the 
the community to provide free municipal expertise. So it really played an instrumental role in the creation and now has a voting share in the community. Uh, in uh, Belgium, again, the city of Eclo also has shares in the, in the wind turbines that is co-owned by the local cooperative. And they are actually um, giving away some of their shares to uh, vulnerable consumers. So again, uh, with this intention of uh, addressing fuel poverty. So I don't want to take uh, much more time. I just wanted to include uh, references to two publications that we have authored uh, and co-authored on this topic, if you want to dig further and just maybe say that, that, that really energy community, uh, when cities work, work on this topic, it's really not about, you know, uh, adding a let's say a crowdfunding component to a project and say, okay, this is uh, energy, this is community energy, this is energy democracy. It's really about boosting the local economic fabric. It's about redistributing the revenues of the transition. Uh, and it's about really democratizing the choices and the control over the energy system. And I think this is very important to remind this. Thank you for your attention. And I look forward to hearing the next presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. That was a, a very, very helpful overview of how uh, local authorities can be directly involved, but also uh, indirectly and, and facilitate uh, a supporting framework for energy communities. Uh, for example, this uh, participation code, as I, I found a, a key takeaway, and, and it's very nice to see that there's a, a direct reference to citizen energy communities. Um, okay, um, I, I suggest that we move on uh, now. Um, now let's have a look at uh, the cooperation examples. And, and for that, I would first like to uh, introduce Annegal Baptiste, uh, who is energy, uh, the energy engineering manager in the public construction department of the city of Paris. Uh, Annegal, uh, please enlighten us about the, the Paris project. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here today and I will talk to you about uh, this photovoltaic project carried out with a citizen collective in Paris. So. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see the slides on my screen. Do you see my slides? No, I cannot see, but oh, okay. yes. The next slide, please. So Paris first climate action plan date by dates back to 2004, but in its 2018 edition, uh, it aims at making Paris a low carbon even carbon neutral city by 2050. And to achieve this result, uh, it means cutting by 50% energy consumption, uh, which is the priority. But then the target is also to power the city uh, by 100% uh, renewable energy and also to have 20% roofs equipped with solar uh, plants. So um, this photovoltaic uh, project uh, carried out with the, the citizens um, started uh, with a Paris participatory budget in 2016. Uh, several people registered uh, projects related to local production of energy and these projects were combined into one and some of these people came together in the collective called Enercitif. So this project carried out by Enercitif um, uh, took a little time to become clear, but they were mainly looking for roofs on which to install solar panels. And the city of Paris services worked on how to set up such a project which had uh, never been done before with uh, the citizens. So next slide, please. So setting up the, the project required uh, different teams uh, to work together on legal issues, on technical works, etc. And uh, the strong political commitment was very important to mobilize uh, the different teams in Paris. Um, the mayor uh, herself, uh, the district mayors, as well as uh, elected officials, all visited the solar plants as soon as they were completed, for example. And this strong political support makes such project easier for the teams uh, who have to deliver results and sometimes who have to overcome difficulties. So um, now I will detail a little bit the, the role of the Paris teams in such a project. So as uh, Alex said before, there are several ways for a city to support uh, the a solar citizen uh, project. Uh, first, the city of Paris provided the solar cadaster of its territory. Uh, it means that it gives information on the solar potential of each building or each roof. And um, 
all owners, uh, private ones and public ones, uh, can thus identify the places suitable for solar panels. It is a first step. But then uh, even with the solar cadaster, there are still a lot of technical items to check to confirm the feasibility, like roof waterproofing or roof load bearing capacity. And uh, it is a great help for a project owner to have some serious information on these topics provided by the administration. So uh, after we confirmed uh, several roofs uh, were feasible, uh, the city of Paris issued a call um, for expression of interest in order to identify anyone who wanted to implement such a solar project. And uh, Inner City was the only one uh, to have gone to the end of the procedure. So uh, an agreement uh, granting a temporary occupation was signed between Inner City and the city of Paris. And uh, although uh, Enercitif knew how to hire experts to carry out the projects with them, uh, the City of Paris services uh, supported the project holder on administrative, technical or organizational aspects for the works, for example. So next slide, please. Uh, sorry, next slide again. <laughs> So uh, this, uh, my next point is on care figures of the project. So this project is on nine uh, public building roofs. Uh, it's, uh, that is say on schools, on uh, middle schools and uh, on sports centers mainly. But NRCT also carries out uh, six projects with the three major landlords, social landlords in Paris. But for the nine public roof uh, project, uh, from a technical point of view, the total power of solar plants is 516 uh, kilowatt peak, uh, ranging from 36 to 100 kilowatt peak. Uh, with Paris climate and sunshine, uh, it corresponds to an expected energy production of uh, 465 megawatt hour per year, uh, which is about uh, the consumption of uh, 200 households. And all the energy produced is injected uh, to the public uh, distribution network. And uh, from a financial point of view, the capex of the whole project is uh, 820,000 euros. And um, as in the north of France, uh, on quite small projects like the ones of a 36 kilowatt peak, uh, it's not easy to come out with a profitable project. So um, in order to make the project pr uh, possible, uh, especially with a citizen collective, the city of Paris chose a relatively low fee for the grant and also a long uh, lens for the agreement. But uh, the participatory budget was also needed to subsidize the project and make it uh, financially balanced. So next slide, please. Um, another significant point of the project is that it produces local renewable energy, but it is not its only goal. Uh, as I said before, uh, to address uh, ongoing climate changes uh, uh, challenge, reducing energy consumption remains a priority and uh, involving all stakeholders uh, can make them adopt uh, the appropriate response. Uh, and Initiative as an association uh, plays a role in raising citizens' awareness uh, for example, they organize uh, Initiative Wednesdays. Uh, it's times for discussion on selected topics, and they can share some knowledge with Parisian and also convince uh, some of them to get involved in concrete actions. And the 320 investors associates in the collective and also the 60 active members working as volunteers on the solar project are also very good ambassadors for the subject. And besides, the association creates also educational tools to engage Parisian in climate changes. For example, in the middle schools where the solar panels are installed, Initiative organizes session with the students in science classes to, to talk about solar technology. And they can also participate in career forums or, or session to initiate to citizenship, et cetera. So next slide, please. Okay, so 
today, uh, what five of the nine solar plants are already producing electricity. Uh, for two of them, uh, the installation is ongoing. And for the last two, the installation is scheduled before the end of the year. So now the political will is uh, to replicate and upscale this project with a new program called Energy Culture. Uh, the ambition is to offer better opportunities with more roofs and larger roofs for projects to be profitable. And so we are looking for opportunities again on public building, but the idea is also to take on public or private partners to increase the number of roofs. And uh, still, it's not always easy to identify roof and to check the feasibility. Uh, and it's sometimes difficult also to finance their rehabilitation, but we have good hope. And uh, what I wanted to say also is that um, to maintain sustainable mobilization over time, the city of Paris also will open in September its Climate Academy, uh, which purpose is uh, transmitting scientific knowledge, acquiring skills to act, and uh, supporting project leaders in the field of ecological transition as a continuation of what uh, has been done with this project. So, that is what I wanted to present, and I will be happy to answer your question at the end of the session. Thank you uh, very much um, for that interesting presentation, Anagael, um, which illustrates very clearly and practically how energy communities can contribute to city level climate ambitions, uh, but also the, the greening of, of public buildings. Um, thank you. Um, let's move on to Jean van Dale, the, the president and co founder of the energy cooperative Energent uh, in his hometown of Ghent. Uh, John, the, the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Yes. Uh, could you put on the slide, please? Okay. So I was uh, listening to Angael uh, giving the example of Paris. And in fact, I must say that uh, the title of this um, webinar is about energy communities. And I must say that our hope was that this kind of project that Angael described, um, that the new laws of the EU would in fact enlarge the feasibility of that kind of project. So to make it possible that for instance, the production of this solar energy on the roof of schools could be shared in the neighborhood, eh? that you don't, that just don't put it on the net where you are uh, paid a very small amount uh, um, if you just inject it on, on, on the net. So, but until now, I must say uh, the, the Belgian um, um, applications or implementations of energy community uh, laws or directives uh, have not been yeah, very hopeful in this regard. So what I will be describing now is what we have been doing and what I have seen as a journalist, in normal life I'm a journalist, um, in other countries as a kind of cooperation bet between cooperatives and cities. Because I, I found out that this is really, they can be very complementary. And of course the directive on energy communities would could enlarge this potential very much, but until now we have not seen anything of this. Um, but I'm, I'm still hopeful, huh? but um, so, okay, the next slide, please. Yeah, so that's what I just said that it's cities and cooperatives are really a good match huh? and uh, potential could be even bigger if this, um, um, directive of energy uh, communities is, is translated, is implemented in, in, a, in a positive way. The next slide, please. Yes, so my first uh, experiences of uh, cooperation between uh, cities and cooperatives was in the city of Kassel, where I saw a Stadtwerk, which is a, like a public company for energy and water, usually. Um, implemented a big wind project together with the cooperative. In fact, the cooperative started, was uh, funded the evening that I was there in City Hall. Um, and so it was a project of 30 million euros 
um, for seven huge uh, wind turbines and uh, the know-how so the, the license to build it had already been acquired by this uh, public uh, instance, the Stadtwerk. Um, and so now they were gathering money from the citizens, uh, which would finance it uh, for 80% and the rest 20% would be financed by the Stadtwerk. Um, and I remember that the mayor was there that evening and he said, yeah, I will invest 10,000 euros in the cooperative. So a very, I must say in Germany, my impression was that um, this cooperation, this idea of we will do it locally was very well, almost natural. Uh, uh, local banks were also involved. Uh, another example also in the, um, the um, Hessen, so which is part of Germany, um, Wolfhagen, there you had a local Stadtwerk, Stadtwerk which had uh, financial problems. It was a Stadtwerk in water and energy and uh, a cooperative was uh, funded uh, and started uh, to invest in this Stadtwerk. And, and so in, in this way, um, they, um, yeah, they could give um, more possibilities to the Stadtwerk to invest, for instance, in uh, solar, solar energy project, projects. So what I mentioned here is the Lokale Wertschöpfung, which is a German word for, well, uh, which to say that with local money, we will create local jobs and local, uh, oh, this is something else here. Oh, yeah. um, with local money, we will create local jobs and local uh, surplus value. So could we go to the next slide, please? Yes, now I go to Belgium. So the first thing we did with uh, in Ghent, uh, which is a cooperative in the neighborhood of Ghent, which is a city about uh, 250,000 uh, inhabitants, um, was the neighborhood yard. If you translate it in Dutch, it is Wijkwerf. So it's a yard that you have in a neighborhood um, and um, where you try to promote and stimulate citizens to renovate their house. And it's a combination of the cooperative, which has the no technological know-how and flexibility, and the town and the local government, um, which can, um, yeah, for instance, if they are involved, they have all the addresses of the citizens and can stimulate also the citizens to cooperate. We have found out that if we have to do it on our own without the city in our back to say, okay, it's a good moment now to uh, renovate your house. There, there are some subsidies. You have this energy cooperative which will uh, uh, guide you in this project. Uh, if, if you don't have a city that cooperates, you have less participants. So our experience with the neighborhood yards, which we have, which we have done a lot uh, in the meantime, is that they tend to be stronger uh, if the city is behind you and um, in smaller towns, because usually uh, if you have bigger cities, they, they have more know-how of their own and they need less uh, of, the, of the cooperative. Um, we have also been working, oh, there's only one minute left, I see here, uh, by Achil. Yeah, so next slide, please. Yeah, we have done uh, a lot of large PV installations where the COPE brings in the money and the know-how and the city, the roof. Uh, um, our experience is that complementarity is bigger in smaller towns um, because these smaller towns don't have that knowledge to do that of their own. Uh, with wind power, I told you already, uh, this happens in Germany uh, and also in several parts of Belgium where um, the wind projects are developed by cooperatives or commercial developers, but where the city uh, or the local port, municipal port company participates. For instance, in Antwerp, every windmill which is uh, uh, installed in the port is half owned by the city uh, port company. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and now I come to Buurzame Strom, which can be translated as neighborhood current, I think. Uh, it started as an idea of citizens, so that an, an initiative of the city to uh, ask citizens, what would you like to do in your neighborhood? And the dream of many neighbors was, well, we don't have an own roof, but we would still like to have solar energy. Um, 
why do people not have an own roof? Because they rent, of course. And so the idea was, well, we would like to invest in a collective solar installation, for instance, on the roof of our school, of our school and that we then can consume this um, a local energy. And, and that in this way that the project started. Uh, I must say, this is still an ideal, but it's still not possible in Flanders. And I, I know, I don't know if it's possible in other countries, but the regulations don't allow this because every time you use uh, the public net, uh, the prices are thus that it, it is not uh, feasible and not uh, profitable to make uh, that kind of structure where you have a, a, a collective PV installation on, on the roof of a school. And then the people who have invested in this installation, people, in the neighborhood can consume this locally produced energy that is not uh, feasible for the time being. So what did we end up doing then uh, finally is that we tried to find out what are the difficulties of people who don't have a known uh, roof, who don't have enough money to invest themselves um, in a uh, solar installation to uh, people living in apartment blocks, so not with the, their own private roof, how can they invest in um, solar energy? That was, uh, we tried to answer all these questions, questions because of, um, yeah, by, by researching this. And then a second thing that we tried to develop because of uh, an EU subsidy, which came on top of it, was that we developed a system uh, to, um, so in the end, we, we ended up producing a lot of solar energy in this neighborhood, but we also developed a system to try to consume this uh, energy in the neighborhood itself. So uh, as, as a kind of, uh, to put it uh, in a kind of metaphor, is that you try as a neighborhood to breathe, to consume energy on the rhythm of the sun, uh, so that you use more energy uh, when there's a lot of sun. Um, so that was in, in, in yeah, very few words, uh, this project of uh, neighborhood current, Buza Mestrom. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And I have to wrap up, I know, uh, already five minutes ago. Yeah, so some conclusions. Uh, there's a lot of complementarity between local governments and cooperatives, uh, but the condition is, of course, that there is trust and mutual respect. Um, and yeah, it also depends on the characteristics. Uh, the the complementarity is bigger usually in smaller towns. Uh, the EU competition laws can be, can be a stumbling block in this uh, regard that it does not automatically make a difference between uh, a, a purely for profit, profit company and a cooperative. So the um, cities uh, have to adapt their, um, yeah, uh, process uh, processes to make sure if they want to work and to choose for a cooperative, it's not self-evident. They, they, they have to do it in, in the right way. Um, and then, um, yeah, okay. I, th I think I will wrap up here, actually. Yeah, because I'm okay. over time. Yeah. <laughs> no problem, uh, John. Um, I, I found it very interesting. Thank you. Um, it's, it's good to learn about the, the, the Belgian experience and, and the importance of, of, well, the potential of a collaboration between local authorities and energy communities to uh, facilitate access to renewables for, for the energy poor and, and the most uh, disproportionately impacted by the energy uh, transition. Um, and, and there were some very interesting lessons as well. Uh, if, if the city participates, you have a higher potential for members to, to, to in, be included. It's a very, very interesting lessons to draw from that project. Um, now, uh, last but not least, I will give the floor to Annemarie Hoffman, who is a participation strategist um, for wind energy and heating networks at Groninger uh, Power, uh, situated in the city of Groningen in the Netherlands. And she's also celebrating her birthday today. Uh, happy birthday, Annemarie. And uh, the floor is here. Thank you. Um, welcome. Thank you very much. Also, the previous speaker is very interesting. And um, uh, I recognize a lot of your uh, experiences. And uh, um, yeah, thank you very much. So um, yes, indeed, I'm reaching out from Groningen in the Netherlands. And, um, uh, and indeed, I'm in a very festive mood because it's my birthday. So uh, thank you for joining me on my special day. Uh, Groningen is 
a really fantastic city in the north of, uh, of, of, uh, of Holland. And sometimes people think that I work for the tourist office here uh, because I'm always so excited about Groningen, but I actually work for Groningen Power, uh, which is the local um, energy corporation here. Groningen Power is one of uh, the biggest energy corporations of, uh, of the Netherlands and the biggest of uh, the northern part. Um, now, let me guide you through our story and the challenges that we encountered in the process of the neighborhood uh, heating. Can you maybe uh, please the next slide? So briefly about Grunige Power, so we, have, we are the uh, local energy corporations and our members, around 2000, they are awesome. Uh, they are the pioneers in the change and that we believe that our city and also the world really needs. We are working on creating a collective energy infrastructure with sun, wind and heat. But the real power we believe, that's the power in the people. You won't be surprised as we believe in a maximum bottom-up approach in order to realize a sustainable future for at least Groningen. Next slide, please. So about this system. So we believe um, that our Dutch social economic model has to change in order to really create the values that our society needs right now. For years, the government and market has been uh, dominant, sidelining society in general. In other words, ordinary citizens are consumers, voters, and taxpayers. But the government applies incentives such as subsidies, uh, but also rules and restrictions in its attempt to spur people in action. But it often fails. We feel that people um, uh, need an intrinsic motivation to act. And for this reason at Groenig Power, we believe that we need to change, uh, that we all need to change this playing field, the rules of the game and the game itself, in order to um, fully um, uh, make this change work. So that means for us that we literally give the people uh, the power. We believe that if we provide them with knowledge, time, and a clear and equal role in the playing field, our new energy. Um, uh, system will develop. This all sounds really great, um, but we are pioneering every day and it's really hard work. And I'm sure that a few of us uh, recognize that. Um, it's about social change. So um, we are pioneering, but we are not the first ones who do this. Um, in Holland, um, an example of a resident-owned cooperative heating project already exists um, in the city of Culemborg, close to Utrecht in the center of Holland. Uh, Thermo Bella runs a collective heating system based on thermal energy generated by drinking water. Cooperative initiatives are also underway in other locations such as Wageningen and Amsterdam, Heeg and the famous place called Ter Heiden. Um, so pioneering, but definitely not the only ones. Next piece, please. So in Groningen, um, we are working on citizen-owned heating since 2018. In this area, specifically called Paddenpool. And Paddenpool is probably the most average area in Groningen. The people who live there are from all ages, backgrounds and walks of life. And they enjoy a green and diverse neighborhood and the neighborhood facilities. Um, Let's mention, for example, shopping mall Paddenpool, uh, which is the most average uh, shopping mall you will ever see. Um, that's Paddenpool. Um, let me tell you about the playing field that we encountered while, uh, uh, while uh, creating this neighborhood heating in this specific area of Paddenpool. So the municipality of Groningen and the local heat company called Warmtestad, which would translate into heat city, planned a district heating network through the area of the district Paddenpool. The local citizen initiative of Paddenpool at that time asked Warmtestad if households could also be connected to that net. Unfortunately, that was for economical reasons only possible for social housing flats and larger buildings. Well, then we said, if the mountain won't go to Moses, then the Moses will go to the mountain. So we started our own neighborhood heating project. And in this period, 2018-2019, Grunige Power, together with Shell, stepped in and worked out a new plan together with the residents. Shell participated also with knowledge and funding. As you probably know, since uh, 2013, here in Groningen, we have serious problems with earthquakes because of the exploration of natural gas. 
So Shell wanted to support sustainable innovations in Groningen. Um, the results of this process uh, can also be read in a magazine that you see on the slide, uh, but it's also available on our website if you're particularly interested in the details. Now, let me, uh, please, next slide. As a cooperative, together with the, system, uh, the citizens, we uh, identified seven key drivers. For citizens, cooperative members and customers, um, the three most um, uh, important drivers are a local and sustainable heat source, not more expensive in the end than natural gas, and continuous comfort. For us as a cooperative enterprise, as for the municipality of Groningen, an essential condition is that the uh, project is reliable and scalable. Together with the condition not more expensive than natural gas, we had to look at the whole district heat configuration from a professional economic point of view. So a small neighborhood uh, owned network is beautiful, um, but um, uh, it was not financially durable uh, in, the uh, in the exploitation phase. Last but not least, um, it was also not possible to professional, professionally uh, maintain and service it. So please, the next slide. Extracting heat in the summer in the nearby river called Rijdiep, um, storing this heat safely in an aquifer, and I don't know if that's an English word, but I, that doesn't matter. Well, at the, at the depth of approximately 150 degrees and adding um, it to this layer in the winter, extracted and raised to a higher temperature using heat pumps. And the water flow in the right deep, right deep uh, cannot continually produce enough energy to heat the neighborhood. The right deep can provide probably a thousand households. And in the heat, uh, heat source strategy from the municipality of Groningen, other sources are needed, such as industrial heat, recovery and sun thermal and geothermal heat. So it was actually kind of clear that we had to work with the municipality of Groningen and the local public heat company Warmtestad on a greater system level. We started with a conceptual design for 500 households in Paddepool Noord. And soon after the start, the local citizens in the existing energy collective we worked with got divided. We decided that the project had to go on and we continued with hiring them as uh, individual uh, professionals. That worked fine and we scaled up uh, the number of local citizens who got enthusiastic for the project called Buurtwarmte. Where we did not succeed at that time was in scaling up the local energy initiative. With an investment of almost uh, 14 million we, for approximately 500 homes, this turned out to be a costly solution. So we would have liked to continue the first pilot, but the economic feasibility and scalability were the most deciding factors in the decision to draw up an alternative plan and think bigger. Um, I'm almost there. I see that we are running out of time, but I still have two more slides. So next slide, please. The cooperatives in the Netherlands are inspired by the heating networks in Denmark. And the Danish government laid down the general conditions that district heating companies are not allowed to generate financial shareholder profit. And as a result, the cooperative model performs best in terms of affordability and quality when compared to municipal and commercial district heating networks. Vice versa, the cooperatives are attractive customers for large-scale renewable energy suppliers. And Groningen Power is now working together with the uh, municipality of Groningen on neighborhood heat plan Northwest, which involves Paddepool, Vinkhuizen, who also has a really nice uh, shopping mall, and Selbert, um, which will be ready at the end of 2021. This involves a total of approximately 3,000 um, 3100 sorry homes so on that scale the investment per home is significantly lower and it will be so much easier to earn uh, back in the long run moreover we, we can also copy uh, the design of the large scale heat network to other districts and the next last but not least uh, slides as i said earlier we have lost the momentum in Paddepool due to the divided cit citizens and the scale up then with every scale up, you need to be aware um, you should also scale down. Um, we are now building up a community for the plan for a larger heat network. 
the neighborhood collective is now entering a larger playing field. That was not foreseen. The residents are now in the process of re reorganizing themselves and relating to the larger plan. The majority of them have always said that other neighborhoods should also be able to participate. And in Finkhuizen and Selwort, we had a very fresh start. Actually, yesterday I had a meeting uh, with the people from Finkhuizen, and that is always a highlight of my week. It's fantastic to work with people who are intrinsically motivated. And also in Potapol, new engagement is building up. And in the upcoming phase, and they will contribute ideas and decisions when making technical choices and what a joint neighborhood uh, heat cooperative could look like in the exploitation uh, ex, um, plantation phase. We ultimately want to arrive at the best choices um, through joint fact finding. Doing that with local citizens, I said it before, that is really hard work. I have never drunk so much coffee with local citizens in my life as during the participation process uh, as we do it now. The amount of PowerPoint presentations we have is ridiculous. And the number of people at the city council who say that we are the crazy ones to get bigger every day. But we are doing it and we are succeeding. And for that, we are very proud. So thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you so much, Anna Marie. Um, I think I stopped sharing the screen. I had to take over because you uh, ah. need to go to the next uh, session. Uh, I hope everyone could still follow um, your presentation, which was uh, very interesting and very good to see how um, energy communities potential is also materializing in the district district heating uh, sector. Quite a uh, novel perspective um, right there uh, beyond the electricity market. Now, um, we have all heard all of our uh, distinguished speakers uh, talk. Um, there would be normally a Q&A. Um, I would say that I will um, start by providing some key messages to the participants. And then thereafter, um, we are in the position to extend the, the, the session slightly to, to have some questions asked and, and uh, responded, but it's completely up to the audience whether they want to want to stay or move to the, the next um, session. So um, we have reached um, almost the end uh, formally of this session. Um, before I leave you some, some uh, key reminders, uh, at 4 p.m. there will be another session uh, dealing with smart cities and communities, which will be uh, of interest to the audience as well. Uh, please make sure to per participate to uh, the virtual fair taking place on the 16th of June in the afternoon. Don't forget to network via the network platform on your dashboard. And uh, last but not least, cooperation between energy communities and local authorities will be supported uh, under the Life Clean Energy Transition Program. A session on the program will take place tomorrow at um, 2.30 p.m. Uh, Sinai will organize an info day explaining the details on the call for topics in the second half of July. So that's um, quite interesting for, for all of the local authorities that are present here today uh, to definitely have a look at that. Uh, and with that, um, I wish Achille, to close. Achille, yes? What's the name of that project that will? It is the Life Clean Energy Transition Program. Uh, under which uh, funding will be foreseen to facilitate the cooperation between energy communities and local authorities. And it's good to, to, to repeat indeed, John, because it's, uh, it's quite an important uh, message. Um, and with that, I, I wish to formally close the session at least. Um, like I said, there is a possibility for questions. We will do that after I formally close. Please stay uh, if you have any lingering questions or urgent questions that you would like to see answered. And I, I hope, of course, that the, the, the distinguished speakers uh, will be uh, able to stay a little bit longer as well. So um, I want to thank everyone uh, for their contribution today, uh, for their active participation, but also to listen in and to learn um, from these uh, many, many interesting uh, projects that illustrate the, the cooperation uh, potential between local authorities and energy communities. Uh, the recordings of this session will be available on the conference website uh, shortly. Um, I have learned a lot on energy communities and the role of local authorities, and I, I hope you did as well. Uh, and have a, have a great day um, if you're not staying for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. And then um, I suggest we, we move on to the Q&A um, for the, the, the people that are still um, here today. I think we received um, one particular question that was raised uh, during the session of John. Um, it was a question by L.O.D. Denizar. I hope I pronounce it well. Um, probably not. Um, do you know, John, if there are any projects relative to micro hydro production? A uh, hydropower production around water mills, notably. Yes, yes, there are, but uh, not very many because Flanders is quite flat, so there's not much oof, energy to be captured by falling water uh, uh, if you live in such a region. But uh, there are some, um, yeah. And in France, I think there will be much more, yeah. Mm. As Alex okay. is already saying, yeah. So I don't know okay. if I can say something more. Uh, in fact, you could say that uh, the the Flemish or the, the Belgian cooperative movement when it comes to con energy started with the water project in Rotselaar um, with EcoPower, which is the big uh, energy cooperative in, in Belgium. Well, yeah, their first project was uh, in Rotselaar on a, yeah, a rather small river, but there was a water mill and, and uh, they started to use the this energy. Okay, thank you, John. And I see Alex also provided some additional information uh, from the UK. Uh, very helpful. Thank you for that, uh, Alex. Um, I see another uh, question has popped up from Carl, Carl uh, Lauer, um, which is, I think, a very, very apt question. Um, and, and I do know uh, a particular working group working on this uh, within uh, the framework of Bridge. Um, but maybe any of the other uh, speakers who want to come in and complement uh, the question if, is whether anyone is working on government's model that regulates how the decisions are taken between these diverse actors, local authorities, SMEs and natural persons, how to balance their interests, how to ensure that they are uh, making decisions on a level playing field and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, any any of the speakers wants to uh, compliment here and, 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 and say a few things. Uh, I see John. Uh, go ahead, John. Yes, for the project Buurzame Stroom, which is difficult to translate, but Anna-Marie knows it's an interesting name. So it's neighborhood current, but it sounds also like sustainable current. So um, there we have developed the whole structure with indeed the university, city representatives, of course, representatives of the cooperatives, representatives of social organizations, representatives of the uh, local distribution network, who all have, yeah, in a way, um, steered the project, yeah. Um, and and uh, and now there will be a phase two, and this consortium, as it is called, has survived and will continue, uh, and and now develop. Another project, which is more ambitious, which is wants to guide several neighborhoods in the direction of net zero, especially now working on warmth uh, with with heat pump, because the the other one was uh, on only on solar energy electricity, but now, of course, heating in a country like Belgium is a big problem, uh, um, and and so yeah, they will be working on this with this network of organization as a kind of steering committee, yeah. I see, John, very interesting. Any of the other speakers um, want to come in here? Um, if not, I, I would have a small follow-up question. What is the distribution of how, how we are? Oh, Anna-Marie, you go ahead then. Yeah, well, I was actually raising my hand in order to let you know that I'm leaving the uh, meeting, <laughs> but I will... Um, uh, leave my uh, contacts in the chat if there are any questions uh, uh, according to the presentation. And thank you everyone for your attention. Have a really nice day. Very kind. Happy thank birthday. you, Anna Marie. And happy birthday. <laughs> Enjoy it. Bye. And John, I, I just uh, a small follow up question. Uh, what the distribution of, of voting rights be between this consortium when they make decisions? Is it is it one member, one vote based or, or how is this allocated? Yeah, you're thinking now too formal, Achille. So it, okay. it's really, yeah, you try to find a consensus, something that is interesting for everybody. Of course, 
for instance, the representative of the distribution network, we would have liked him to convince his, because this is a huge company, uh, to convince his, his company to make more things possible. Uh, that we, this dream we had that if you have a solar installation that the people around can use and they invest in this, that the people around, whether they have an own roof or not, can profit from this solar energy. But he was not able to convince this company, which with two or 3,000 people working there. So yeah, we had to accept that. Huh? Yeah, so you roll with uh, reams you have, or how do you call that in English? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 you, I, I know the Dutch expression, but I, the, the translation uh, doesn't come to mind. Uh, it's a bit like the apple doesn't fall, for, or the don't hold me for the monkey. Uh, these, these types of literal uh, translations of expressions, yeah. Uh, yeah. which turn out quite funny. Yeah. Um, I, if I if I look into the, the the chat, I don't see any uh, further questions. Um, if I'm mistaken, please repost. Um, and otherwise, I think we are um, ready to close this session so that everyone can go to the next one on smart cities and communities. I want to thank everyone uh, once again for participating. I want to thank the audience, but I also want to thank our speakers for taking the time uh, to share their knowledge with us. Uh, have, a, have a lovely day and um, see you at another occasion for more talks about energy communities. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Achille. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.